<laughs> Let's give it up for the worship team one more time. Wasn't that great? That was a great time in worship. You guys heard Lori with the high notes this morning? I heard it. She tried to pretend like she couldn't do it, but we knew the truth the whole time. The whole time. There we go. That ain't going to stay open. We'll just open it when we get to it. How's that? <laughs> all right. I'm glad that you guys are all here. I panicked a little bit when I got here this morning because we started playing the announcement video, and I thought I was wearing the same shirt, which probably wouldn't bother anybody but me, but I was like, oh, but it's not the same shirt, okay? That one was a V-neck. This is a polo, okay? There are buttons. It is different. That's important. Write that down, okay? Um, so before we get started, I just want to take a second. Something that was not in the video is we are going to be doing baptisms on Easter Sunday, all right? So if that is something that you are interested yeah, go ahead and clap for that. That's exciting. We can clap for baptisms, all right? So if that's something that you are interested in, if you want to get a little bit more information, you can either go online to our website. You can sign up right there, generationswithaz.church. You can also take that green connection card that should be in a seat near you. You can fill that out. Just let us know you're interested in baptism, and we will make sure you have all the information that you need. Sound good? Yes. Everybody good? Yes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. So now that you have that information, we're ready to get into the thick of it. All right. Are you guys ready? Yes. Daryl looks ready. Are the rest of you ready? Yes. All right. I'm going to start off with arguably the most important question that I've ever asked anybody, okay? <laughs> you guys ever seen a couple argue in public? <laughs> Just show of hands, okay? All right, show of hands. We've seen a couple argue in public, right? Isn't that just the best? Isn't that just one of the things that just makes your day, okay? Like, if, if you're me, right? If you're going to argue in public, I've made it my personal mission to follow you around the grocery store because, like, I want to know how it ends, right? Like, I, I got to weigh in in my own head. Like, you can't verbally contribute to the conversation, right? You can't, you can't push the card and go, like, I mean, she's right, right? You can't, you can't say it out loud. But I do, I do that in my head, right? And so I will follow you around the store, and I will do it in the most low-key way that you don't know that you're being followed, but it's a lot of fun for me, right? And my philosophy, like somebody might be like, Adam, that's their personal business. You don't need to be just f listening. And I'm like, look, if you're going to argue next to the bananas, and I'm here to get some bananas, what happens next is on you, okay? That's my personal belief. And so, now, I don't know how long you're allowed to listen, right? Like, I don't know if there's a cutoff, but I'm going to follow you, right? I'm going to follow you until I lose interest in it, and I'll just start putting stuff in the cart that I do not need. I'm like, ah, spatulas, yes, I have 12, but I think I need another one. Might all, sure, that might come in handy. Like, I'm just going to put it in there, and so I'll just acquire stuff that I'm never going to use, but I will find out how that argument ends, okay? It's important to me, right? And because I do this, and this is like half a joke, half not, like I have followed people in the store before, just because I'm curious. I just want to see how it ends. And I've noticed that through these moments, right, people kind of get into what you consider like the, the classic trap of, of relationships, right? You got, you got the guy, you got the girl, the girl's trying to express her feelings, the guy's trying to solve a problem, and those things don't always go together at the same time. This is what I've heard. I'm sure none of you do this. But the people that are next to the bananas, they do this all the time, okay? And so when you're going out, and this, this is what happens, right? And it's fun, and it's interesting, and you kind of just have a really clear picture of that, like, you know, boys are from Venus, you know? Actually, my favorite, if you've ever been to middle school, you may have heard this one. My favorite one is uh, girls go to college to get more knowledge. Boys go to Jupiter to get more stupider. That's a classic. You can write that one down as well. But I've just kind of learned that what often happens in moments like that is that we see this back and forth, and you start to realize that the goal is different, right? Like the woman's like, I just want you to listen to me. And the man's like, I am, but I'm listening to you to solve the problem because if we don't, you're going to complain about the same thing in four days. I'm trying to help you. And she's like, you know what would help me is if you shut up and you listen. He's like, I am. And then, and then you just follow him, and it's great. And so this is what happens. And we're going to take a pivot real quick, and it's going to be obvious and comedic because that's what you do. But how often do we do this with the things of God? Right? We have these moments. And so right now we're talking about revival. 
right? We've talked about setting the, setting the stage for revival. We've talked about making sure the atmosphere is conducive for revival. But the question that follows is once we do all that, what's the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? Okay? And we're going to come back to that idea in just a second. But I'm going to go ahead and read. If you have your Bibles and you want to open to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, if you don't have your Bibles, what is wrong with you? No, I'm just kidding. If you don't have your Bible, it'll be up on the screen. But we're in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. And it says this. It says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober... Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So I want to talk to you guys for just a few minutes this morning, just simply about the goal of revival. Jesus, we love you. Father, we thank you for this morning, God. We thank you that we have moments like this that are so readily accessible to us, God, that we can take time out of our schedule. We can open up the door for you. We can have your word, God, just spoken over us, God, that we can dive into this, God, and we know that when these moments happen, that you use it to shape us, to mold us, to guide us, and to lead us into what you have for us, God. So this morning, Lord, we are ready, we're excited, and we're listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So I grew up in church. I don't know if you know this about me. I grew up in church. And when you grow up in church, you start to hear certain phrases repeated a lot. Some of them just become part of the culture. Some of them... Every time you hear them, you kind of do like a little wince because you don't like them or they, you know, just take you back to your trauma. They, you know, you're like, I don't want it. Don't say that, you know. And one of these things that I've heard so many times, and you probably have as well, right? Somebody will just be looking at you, a well-meaning person. They're like, well, God works in mysterious ways. Daryl, sometimes God works in mysterious ways. And sometimes, in my experience, that's what people say when they've run out of actual things to say, and they don't know how to continue the conversation. They're like, well, you're still asking me questions, and so I'm just going to pivot and say, well, God works in mysterious ways, so that way you leave me alone, because God works in mysterious ways. And that's not wrong, right? Like, that's not an incorrect statement, but there's more to it, I would say. And I was writing in my notes, and and I, I wrote this, and I said, mysterious ways, That's because we have often made no effort to understand God's goals. His means might be mysterious. I don't think his goals are. So the the way God might be working in our lives, sometimes that might take some time to really internalize it, to understand, to, to kind of pick up on like, okay, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? What's happening here? Okay. But when we really start to understand God, when we're in his word, when we have relationship with him, the way he's trying to accomplish something may not be clear, but what he's trying to accomplish, that's pretty clear, right? Can we agree with that this morning? Okay. And so sometimes when we're not sure of God's goals, we tend to assume what he would do, and then we do that, right? And Sometimes, that gets us in a place where we have what I would say is the appearance of of godliness, right? And we go, okay, I've seen God do this before, and so I'm going to operate from this place. And God's over here going, like, I'm not saying we don't go there. I'm not saying we won't go there. What I am saying is I am here, 
Okay, and so when we're trying to, to function out of these places, we have to remind ourselves that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so even though the means may not be something we're privy to, the goals can be. Okay, and so I think God has two goals here, generally speaking. And most of what he does in our lives is, is to further accomplish one of these two things. Okay, the first thing, he's trying to anchor our souls. That's where we get this salvation piece, right? He's trying to invite us into a relationship with him, and he's trying to root us in that relationship. Okay, he's trying to anchor our souls. The second thing is he's trying to establish an accurate representation of himself. So he's trying to anchor our souls, and he's trying to make sure that we look the way we're supposed to look. Okay? And so I'm just going to read this next part real quick. So we're talking about holiness, right? We're just talking about this idea of separation. We're talking about this idea of being set apart. Okay, God is holy because he is separate from all the other things that are not God. Does that make sense? There's nothing like him. There's nobody that's even close. God is God. God is holy because he's a category all his own. Okay? And so you and I, we are not innately holy, right? We don't fit that same category. But we are called to be elevated into that same holiness that characterizes God. Okay, so we are his people and we've been restricted for his special use. Okay, and since you and I belong to God, the way that we approach this idea of holiness is important. It matters how we perceive this. It matters our perspective because God just said to us that our call, he, he called us to be holy. He said, because I am holy. So our job is to be holy because he is holy. Okay? <clears throat> and so since, excuse me, I brought this water up for a reason. Since we have this idea that holiness is important, we can't, invo we can't avoid words like that. Right? We can't avoid really wrestling with this, this idea. Because when we study God's word, we start to see that holiness is not optional, right? It's not an addition. It's not something we can get once we get everything else. This is the requirement that God puts on his people, right? And so when we have these moments, we need to remind ourselves that this is not something that we can just kind of open up at our leisure, right? This is urgent. This is a priority. This is, this is one of those top-of-the-list things. You guys with me? Okay. <clears throat> so I wrote it in my notes like this. We are only as successful as the degree to which we look like Jesus. We are only as successful as the degree to which we look like Jesus. So that begs a question. How good are you, and this applies to me, but I'm going to ask you, how good are you at being molded? Do you find that to be something that's easy for you? Or would you say that you're somebody that fights the process? It's an interesting thought to think about, right? So I want to talk about two things this morning. I've kind of laid some groundwork for us. So I want to talk about two things as it relates to holiness this morning. Okay, two things to remind us of. The first thing is this. Holiness is not a place that you walk to. It's the way in which we walk. Okay, holiness is not a place that we walk to, it's a way in which we walk. Okay, so it's not a destination, and here's why. If holiness was a destination that we could arrive at, once we arrived there, the need for God would be gone. Do we agree with that? I don't need you to tell me how to get somewhere when I'm there, right? I need you to tell me how to get there so that I can make the journey appropriately. Okay, so if God, or excuse me, if holiness is a destination, then there's a way that God can write himself out of his own story. He's not going to do that, <laughs> right? And so if we're talking about this, and it not being a destination, and it's a way in which we walk, that way that we walk is an acknowledgement through faith that what God says brings what only God can bring. Okay, God, what God says brings what only God can bring. And holiness keeps us out of spaces that are dangerous to us, right? So imagine this just for a second. If you are a pedestrian, right? You're just, you're out, you're meandering, you're walking around. 
Like, traffic's aware that you're there, right? But traffic doesn't hop out of its lane, generally speaking. <laughs> traffic doesn't hop out of its lane to come and run you down, right? But if you as a pedestrian are not paying attention to the way in which you walk, and you walk out of your lane, you walk out of your space, you walk out of where you are protected, there's no telling what can happen to you. When you step out of your space, you step out of your covering, you are in danger. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying it's the way in which we walk. It's the places that we go or that we don't go. It's the voices we follow or that we don't follow. It's the realization and the acknowledgement that there are spaces I can exist safely and there are spaces that if I enter, I will be in danger. And that could be spiritually, that could be emotionally, that could be physically. But when we follow God's plan for holiness, when we prioritize it, when we do what we can to exemplify it, the Lord puts his hand on us. Okay? And so the important thing to, to really make sure that we have here when we talk about this is that when you're talking about being holy, because I've seen this, and I, and I think maybe a lot of the people in the room would agree with that, okay? It is Jesus that makes people holy, not effort, okay? You can't try hard enough to become holy. There's no amount of work that you can do. There's no amount of checklists that you can come up with. You cannot try hard enough into holiness. It does not work that way. And if you've tried it for long enough, you're probably aware of that. <laughs> Right? Because I think to some degree, and that's the tension, right? That's the tension because part of our wiring is, okay, I got to do this. I got to do this. You're telling me it's important. Let me focus on it. Let me do it. Let me make sure, you know. And I understand that, that natural approach to it. But there is absolutely nothing natural about holiness. And so if holiness is not natural, a natural approach is not going to land you in holiness. That's not how those things work, Okay. So we're talking about Jesus is making people holy. It's not our effort. It's not our striving. It's not our, 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 our persona. Like, we can't do it any way other than Jesus, okay? Jesus comes, and through the atonement made on our behalf, we've been covered in the thing that matters to God, and that's the image of his son. That's how holiness works, okay? Are we on the same page? Cool, cool? All right, so we're talking about we don't try harder. We surrender more. That's the only way to increase your holiness quotient. You don't try harder, you surrender more, okay? <clears throat> Worship team, you can go ahead and come back up. Or Chris, yeah. Just Chris. Everybody else stay. So a lot of the time, we equate holiness to simply not sinning, right? The absence of sin equals holiness, right? And, and I, I want to say something here. <clears throat> it's actually, it's, it's about multitasking, so just stay with me. From a neurological standpoint, right, from the way that your brain works in terms of your focus, you cannot actively focus on more than one thing at a time. You can switch between them staggeringly fast. But your active brain, the part of your brain that focuses and dials in and zeroes in, that's a one-task job. Okay? Your subconscious is always doing things, but that part of your brain that goes, one thing. Okay? So what does that mean? How does that relate to this? That means if you're focusing on not sinning, you are still focusing on sin. If you are still focusing on not sinning at its core, that is a sin focus. Which means, you ready for the crazy part? 
That means we're taking our relationship with Jesus. We're taking the enemy of our relationship with Jesus and we're using it as a foundation to build that same relationship. We're using sin, not sinning, but still sin, as the foundation for our relationship with Jesus. Let that wreck your world for a few minutes. We can focus on one thing. We can focus on sin, or we can focus on Jesus. A focus on sin leads us down a path that arrives at what? Legalism, relig yeah, religiosity, a judgmental spirit, and, and the final goal of that place is just a defeated and broken person because we can't, you and I are not capable of handling a sin problem. And if our focus is sin, what direction are we always going? But if we focus on Jesus, that brings on the flip side, the fullness of everything he is to our lives. Are you still going to sin? Of course you are. But your focus is not, shoot, the sin. It's praise God, the Savior. And those are two very different lives. The second thing is that holiness is a call that you and I must answer. It's a call that you and I must answer. When we downplay what we're called to, we give ourselves license to require less of ourselves. And that's a tough place to be. It's also a tough place to get out of. And you would say, well, Adam, you just said it's not about effort. And you're right, I did say that. I did say that. But when the call is significant enough, your effort follows. Your effort's just not steering the ship. Holiness hinges upon lordship, not just accepted salvation. That's the easy part by comparison. We've accepted the salvation. We say, okay, God, I hear you. I know that I've sinned. I'm coming back. I'm turning from my old ways. I believe what you said. And then, and don't get me wrong, that's something to celebrate, right? I don't want to minimize that moment because for some people, that's a difficult moment. And it could be years and years and years in the making. And that's still something to celebrate because heaven still celebrates. So I'm not going to turn my nose up something that heaven is celebrating, right? So heaven celebrates. And then you take one more step. And now this has to inform all the rest of it. You're now walking a path that has forever been changed from that moment. And that means that holiness has to be a priority. Not because we're doing rules, but because this is who God is and we're bearing his name. And if somebody looks at me, who is very much so not God, trust me, I want to make sure I don't give them a false impression of who he is. I don't want somebody to look at me and go, I was, I was kind of interested, but if God's like Adam, I'm out. Can you imagine that being said of you? That you were the speed bump that somebody else had to get over in order to come to Jesus? 
But that's real life. And that's what happens when holiness doesn't matter to us. I'll say it like this. And this is my last thought for this morning. I've never heard anybody say this, but just just hang with me for a second. A church that is not putting an emphasis on holiness is also not putting an emphasis on those who are lost. If we are not putting an emphasis on holiness, we are also not putting an emphasis on those who are lost. And here's why. If we tell them they need it, and we also tell them that we have it, and they can see our lives, we have set ourselves up as proof. Are you with me? We've set ourselves up as proof. Okay, you need it, I have it, look. Okay, so when they look, and they see that it seemed to have made no difference, what evidence do we now have that is compelling? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. This is an interwoven idea. It's about those that follow Christ, but it is equally about those that do not. If they look at you and I, and they say, it made no difference in you. You look just like me. You just don't sleep in on Sunday. Or maybe sometimes you do. What evidence do we now have that is compelling enough to get over the example that our life has painted for them? There's not one. And here's the hard part from a message standpoint. How do you close that out? Because there's no, I can't tell you all to turn on your Bluetooth and then we'll airdrop you some holiness. It doesn't work that way. We can't altar call set up for you to come on and then we'll, we'll pray in some holiness. It doesn't work that way. All I can do is say, here's what holiness is. Here's why it matters. Here's what's at stake. If it's important enough to you, suit up. So this morning, here's what holiness is. Here's why it matters. Here's what's at stake. And if you deem that a worthy goal, Let's suit up. Jesus, we love you. God, we honor you. God, we take these next few moments, God, as we approach you in prayer. And God, right now, we just ask that you would forgive us. God, this is difficult stuff, and there's not a person in the room that does it right all the time. And that's from the front to the back. And so our first order of business is to repent and to say, I understand the call. I understand what you've asked of me. I understand your goals. I know what you're trying to do. And sometimes I'm in your way. And so we ask you to forgive us. And on the other side of that forgiveness, God, we ask that you would just energize these thoughts, Lord. God, we know what this is. We know it's important. We know what is at stake. So, Lord, seal that in our hearts. God, we want to be a church and we want to be individuals that say that this is important, 
and that live like we believed it when we said it was important. God, we know that this is a missing piece. God, we know that there are people that are lost and they're searching and they're looking and if their eyes turn towards us, God, we want to be ready to give the answer for the hope that we have. We want to be ready to respond in a way that you are seen. God, that someone's interest would be piqued. And we say, you're, you're not living like everybody else. And we can say, I know, and that's on purpose. And here's why. So God, right now, we just pray that you would not let us off the hook. God, that we said yes to you. And so we give you permission to convict us God, to, to, to hound us, however you want to say that, God. Don't let us get too far away. God, put us on a short leash. We ask for it. We invite it. We know what's at stake. Father, we love you. And that's the foundation of all us. We love you because you first loved us. And there are people out there who don't feel like they've ever been loved first. And we're on mission. We're on assignment, God. We need to bring that to people. So this morning, we suit up. We invite you into the spaces of our lives, God, where we find that being molded to be difficult. God, we ask that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us insight, God, that if there's something that is hindering us, if there's a weight, if there's sin that so easily ensnares us, God, we want to be of sober mind. We want to recognize these things. We don't want to walk around in our ignorance, feigning strength, when really the stronger position is for us to be aware of the places that we are susceptible to stepping outside of your safety, to stepping outside of your grace and your protection. So we invite you into every single one of those spaces this morning. We invite you to come, to move, to reveal, to have your way. God, lead us guide us, mold us, and shape us. Because we're here for you. We've been set apart for your special use. And we're not here to tell you what that should look like. We're not here to tell you what you can and can't have, the places you are or are not invited. We are yours. And so we close this morning by reminding our souls of that. We have been bought we have been purchased, we have been sealed. And so we yield and we submit to you. God, make us holy because you are holy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I give a big round of applause. That was a great message, Pastor Adam. My name is Pastor Becca and I am going to be your host this morning. If this is your first time, you can do one of two things. We would love to see you in the back. Definitely do that part. But if you would take your phone and scan this QR code, maybe behind me, hopefully we'll get it there. But if not, scan that QR code and you can fill out a connection card. That way we would love to get in touch with you. We have a gift for you in the back. Using this same QR code, baptisms are next Sunday. If you are feeling led that God is placed on your heart, that it's time to make that public declaration and be baptized,
then this is the QR code for you as well. You can scan that one as well Connect on your connection card for more next steps. You can put in there baptism. You can check that box, send that through. We'll get in touch with you. And Lindsay has a, a QR code in the back too. So if you can't scan it with your phone, you have to go see the welcome team. And then also, you see how we did that? Uh, see, we're going to get you back there in one way or the other. Uh, other than that, Easter service, Good Friday service, bring someone with you. This is a great opportunity to bring people. Maybe they're far from church. They're looking for church. This is a great opportunity to have them. We're going to have a lot of fun in the kids' church. We have the Easter Bunny. He's coming. So that's going to be awesome. We're going to have a photo wall. It's going to be so much fun. And I don't think there's anything else I've met, missed. So we're going to pray and dismiss. You guys have a great Sunday. In the name of Jesus, Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we have had this morning. We thank for the convictions that you have given us in our heart, Father. We just ask that we be the hands and feet of Jesus and display the wonderful, wonderful image bearers of God, Father. Just let them see Jesus in us today somewhere.